Test one, two, three. Test one, two, three. I am John Beckman, Professor John Beckman, Dr. John Beckman, the father of Sid, the architect of Ease Me. Smartest artist in the United States of Fartest. Okay, so unfortunately, I recorded a lecture, but only audio. I didn't record the video, so now I have to record my reaction to the audio lecture. And hopefully I will reconstitute what I failed to do. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Okay. Okay, we're ready. Here we go. So did everybody read the paper? Yes. What did you guys think? Did you was it understandable? Yeah, not so bad. So you have read this is from one of the most prestigious journals, Science. Although it's 25 years old, so maybe it's a little bit easier in that sense, but hopefully you have the language now to read these papers. Um, okay, what's there? So the title was Global Transposon Mutagenesis and a Minimal Mycoplasma Genome. And this is from Craig Venter and the Venter Institute. What was the major question? They were trying to find out what genes um, or what portion of the genome for the mycoplasma were absolutely essential. Yes, so they're trying to identify the essential genes. For what organism? Why'd they choose mycoplasma? Because it's the smallest. Yeah, it, at this time, there might be some smaller things, but at this time, uh, these mycoplasma cells were some of the smallest in terms of content, genetic content. And so it's in, uh, their, their hypothesis is kind of like that. If you could identify the essential genes, that that is sort of the minimal requirement of a living organism. And so that you would thereby understand life in the most specific sense by understanding exactly what's required for an uh, actual living organism. Um, so they're actually addressing the question of what is life in this paper, which is one reason it's so cool. Okay, so mycoplasma is this bacteria. It's got no cell wall. So it'd be gram negative. And it can be pathogenic. There are some versions of it that, th that are pathogenic to humans. And there's some, um, there actually are some agricultural like pathogens to cows, I think, too. So they're, it's a important bacteria. What's the one that they're working with specifically? It's the mycoplasma. Genitalium. Genitalium and. Pneumonia. Yep, and so they're actually working with two. So this is number one. This is number two. The mycoplasma genitalium and the mycoplasma new, I'm gonna spell it wrong, new ma. Pneumonia. Why are they working with two? Uh, to compare between the two of them. Yes, very good. Okay, so that was actually the first way that they approached. So if you think about like what they do, that was the first way that they approached trying to figure out what is the minimal subset of genes. They just did a comparison of their genomes under the rationale that whatever is essential to life would be present in both of these strains of mycoplasma. Okay, so they do this genomic comparison um, and they find about 480 orthologs. Right, orthologue is the right term because that means they found a protein in the pneumonia and the genitalium. So those would be orthologous proteins. So they found about 480 of these. And then the next question was, okay, now, of this subset of 480, what's actually the real essential set? Okay. Um, and then what, they, what did they decide that they were going to do to identify that? Transposon Explain how that works. So it's sort of like what we talked in about in last class, where they use transposons to sort of just randomly see uh, what genes are important, because if those genes are important, then the 
Right. So, okay. So I'm going to try to walk through this and you tell me if I go, if I go wrong. So there's transposons. Transposon, again, for review, is a jumping gene. So you can have a gene that encodes a transposon. It has these inverted repeat sequences. You can get made into messenger RNA. That transposon can come back, bind its gene, it pops out. And then how does it cause something to break? So if you have gene X, remember we talked about this, it can insert inside of gene X. So if you get an insert inside that breaks gene X in half, or there's situations where it can break the, if it's up five prime, it can break the terminator. Although they actually kind of discussed this. Uh, did anybody catch that? What did, what did they say about kind of like where it inserts? Uh, depending on where it inserts, it might actually not disrupt the gene fully. So the five prime ends, you can have an insertion there and it's the gene will still work. Yeah, so that, that was actually a thing that they discussed is, um, there might be a situation where a transposon could insert right here, okay? And so that would create something that looked like this. The transposon. And then the rest of gene X. How could this still be a functional gene? Did you catch the, what they said? Like, what are the scenarios under which Gene X still functions? Okay, so so let's think about. Okay, so let's let's list like the ways it could break. So if you disrupted the promoter, if you disrupted the promoter of gene X that could, that could destroy the functionality of the gene. Okay. But the, were you going to say something? Yeah. The transposon has an outwardly facing promoter. Yeah. That's what they said in the paper. The transposon has its own promoter. And so it's kind of like in some situations, perhaps you might have actually just sort of complemented what's called complementation. The gene X might still function if it's running off the transposon's promoter. Okay. So, so you don't you don't always know like you don't know if it inserts r right up five prime you don't always know. Plus there are situations where like if you messed up that start codon ATG, how could Gene X still function even though there's no start codon right there? Now this, if if so if you broke the start codon, which is down here, how could Gene X still function if it didn't have that start codon? It's kind of a trick question. It could, but how? Gases? What? There could be another start codon in there. Yes, that would be called like an up, uh, like an upstream start codon. Like proteins are many codons, and there might be another methionine in here, which is an ATG. So it's totally possible there's just like an upstream start codon in that gene, in whatever gene it is. And it's possible that you might, you might still get transcription of this gene and protein X, and it might just have a little bit of a N-terminal truncation, a deletion on the N-terminus, but that's, that, that might be okay. So essentially like, uh, there are ways in which when a transposon pops in, it can break the gene, but also too, you have to understand that there's some nuance. You're not necessarily gonna break every gene under every situation, and they kind of talked about that. And so they set this basic um, cutoff criteria that they like to find the gene as broken if, it, if the insert was sort of like past some threshold. I think it was like nine codons, something like that. I don't know why they said that, but it's just like they have to set like a... Like a what? Nucleotide yeah, nucleotide nine. There you go. Okay. Um, so, so this is one case where, like, later we're going to kind of look into transposons, and we'll see transposons as um, negative in a sense that their insertion is random. But in here, the the randomness of the insertion is good because they don't know what genes are essential and what are. Uh, not essential. And so the randomness here is actually like a, a feature of the system that they want to utilize. So explain to me like in a sentence, like summarize the transposon idea and how you will then get from that to the list of essential genes.
Chris. So you want to know, like, can you, like, rephrase? rephrase? Yeah. Okay, so we know that they're shooting transposons into the genome. Mm -hmm. Those transposons are going to break some genes. Now, in a sentence, make the final connection of how are they going to get to the conclusion of which genes are essential? By saying, they were saying in the paper that the genes that are non-essential are the ones that are going to have transposons jumping into them. Yes, the ones good. That are essential don't happen. Okay, so essential, essential genes will uh, not get an insert. And non-essential genes, you probably will find, will get a transposon. And the rationale for this is because if it's essential and you get a transposon, in, it's, not, it's, a, it's not actually that the transposon is not inserting. It, it should, in theory, insert throughout the genome randomly. So it should go everywhere. But in the cases where it does insert into an essential gene, then that organism just dies and it's removed from the population. And so the only thing that's going to survive after the initial screen are ones where the transposon inserted into non-essential genes. So that's the rationale. Um, let's look at their data. It's like, what's this? What is this map? This is a map of the insertions. Yes, this is, so, but what are, what are these arrows? Different genes. Yes, so this is a map of the mycoplasma genome. It's kind of crazy, like you can map out the entire genome of an organism like on a page of paper. Uh, and each of these arrows is uh, some gene, and the the so some genes are going to be going left uh, if they're on one strand of DNA. Some genes are going to be going right if they're on the other strand of the DNA. And then these arrows are the transposon insertions. And there's some coding where if it's either down or up, it was either in the mycoplasma genitalium or the pneumoniae. But these are where all the transposons were hitting, okay? What else is worth pointing out about this? Look at this. What do you think this is? Don't look at the color. What do you think, like, if you see something like this in a genome, what, like, given, off, given, given that we've talked a lot about prokaryotic genetic organization, what do you think this is? Yeah, this is some operon. And then if you actually, like, look at it, it's an operon for protein synthesis, which means it's probably ribosomes. Like this is probably a ribosomal operon. And there's no transposons popping into this spot, which makes sense, because if you can't make proteins, you're dead. So this is just an example. It just sort of emphasizes the idea that prokaryotes have very, um, what do you call it? Slim down genetic code. There's not a lot of non-coding DNA. Although there are some spots like here, like for example here between these two genes, that's some non-coding DNA and you get a transposon insert in there because they won't care if it's inserting into non-coding DNA. Okay, let's see. So how does the, okay, so, so now let's go through some of the methods. Did anybody, at some point, the, the, it's weird, the methods were actually like listed in the references. It was weird. Um, there was a reference number nine. Did anybody look at that and read the methodology there? That's... <coughs>
that's this thing. So when they actually talked about like what they were doing, they didn't explain it and they just said like, look at reference number nine. And so here's like actually what they were doing. And so I'm curious, did anybody read this? Nobody read it. So, so a good habit is, um, especially when you're starting, this is more important when you're starting to read papers, is try to actually answer the question of like, how did they actually do this? Like we understand the concept of the idea that they're gonna make transposons, they're gonna shoot them into the genome, um, and then they're gonna look at what's there after they do that experiment. But actually understanding how they do it, you have to look at that, you have to look at those methods. Okay, so let's, let, like, let's go, we can try to go through this. Um, a transposon TN4001. So remember how we talked about genes have names, that's the name of the transposon, TN4001. Comes from this bacteria, Staph, Staphylococcus aureus, or areas, okay? It was made in E. coli on a plasmid. So it's propagated in E. coli on a plasmid. So we've talked about how in the plasmids lecture, one of the usages of plasmids is that they store genetic information and they're used to grow things and build things in E. coli. So that's exactly what they were doing. And then they probably did a mini prep and then they introduced it to mycoplasma by electroporation. Okay, so that's the first thing. So, they're, so they have a plasmid. And on that plasmid is this transposon TN4001, and it's got some inverted repeats, and it probably has some kind of a strong promoter. Okay, and they did some kind of a mini prep from E. coli to purify that, and then they did that word electroporation. What's that? What does that make you think of? Inserting DNA. It is inserting DNA. This is a way to do a transformation. So it's a methodology of a transformation. What do you think it involves? I think it involves using electricity to like say pores so you can't start it. Yes. So electroporation is when you take like a batch of cells and you put some plasmid in the soup and then you press a button on like an electrical machine and it shocks the cells. It's, it's literally as simple as that. You have like a cuvette looks something like this. The cuvette has like metal edges. You put your bacteria in there, you press a button, and the electricity shocks through, and it opens up the pores and the membrane, and then it sucks up some plasmid. That's kind of like what's happening. So then the mycoplasma is gonna take up this plasmid. Okay. So you have some mycoplasma, it's got the plasmid, it's got the transposon, and it's gonna start to mobilize. Okay, and let's read what else they did. Um, and then they have, then they select for, how are they selecting for transposon inserts? Look at that number nine. Gentamicin. Gentamicin, so that's just an antibiotic. And so that makes, that allows us to understand the construct a little bit more. The construct probably actually doesn't look like that. The construct looks something more like the, uh, oh my God. It's right in like a first, first grader. The, the construct probably looks something more like this. Yeah. It's, um, it's a composite. There's two transposed ones. Oh, really? It's, it's I, has two I, I saw that it was a composite, but did they actually say, like, were they talking about the wild type state of it, or did they actually, like, use it as a composite transposon? It's the actual composite one. I have to look for it. It's a. It's so, the, so then you're saying it looks more like this? Yeah. Where they're. And, there's a, and the first one's dead. So it's kind of. Oh, so it is, so it is like T. I wonder if this is, like, a variant of TN5. That's yeah, where the TN comes from. They're all related somewhat, because there's, like, composite. Interesting. And, like, Maybe maybe they isolated this TN4 and then later it, they changed its name to TN5. I don't know. But so we drew this construct. So we understand how it can mobilize a flanking uh, or a, what would you call that? A flanked sequence in between the two transposons. So that's what's happening. Um, okay. And then they're gonna select for the insertions based on the gentamicin, so they'll add gentamicin to the cultures. And then they essentially split and pooled them. 
Okay. So essentially, they get to this stage where after they've done the transformation and after they've done the selection, they essentially have like pools. Let's, I'm just abstractly kind of drawing this out. Let's call this pool one, pool two, pool three. And these pools have essentially like mixtures of different transformants. So they're not actually isolating like individual colonies of transformants. They're just growing in mass a whole bunch of unique transformants together in mixed populations and splitting them into pools. Okay, and then what do they do? What do you, th what do you think needs to happen next? So they've, they've shot the transposon in, they, or they electroporated it in on a plasma, they mobilized it, in theory it went in, they selected for it, they have these populations, now what do they need to do? They need to isolate. Isolate what? Like a single like, colony. So, so they do this without actually isolating a single colony. You're right that they need to isolate like individual sequences but they don't ever actually isolate individual colonies. So they're kind of doing this in like a reduced labor kind of way. What, what were you gonna say? They just do a genomic prep and then just like, they lysol the DNA using the uh, restrictions. Yeah, so, so this is really clever. This is, this is really cool. Um, so like understand the concept of what they wanna do. Or before I go into the detail, like what do they wanna get? They wanna get sequences. Like they want to identify the sequences where these transposons insert. Okay. And so the way that they do that is this technique called inverse PCR. And there's like a Wikipedia page on this. It's, it's pretty easy to understand. The first step is that they, from these pools, so from these pools, the first step is they extract genomic DNA How is genomic DNA different from like a mini prep? We talked about this a lot on Wednesday. Did we? Test that teaching. <laughs> if it reflects on me, this is embarrassing for me, guys. A mini prep which strikes the plasma like specifically. Yeah, a mini prep is a purification for enriched plasmid. What's the difference between plasmid and genomic DNA? That should be easy. Plasmid's just like a small piece. Yeah, so you understand how, like a plasmid is smaller than genomic DNA. And so you can understand how the protocols would probably be different for isolating small chunks versus large chunks. So when you do a genomic extraction, you're trying to extract like the large chromosome. Okay, so just understand like there's a difference. There's different ways to extract DNA and they're doing a genomic extraction, which means they want the actual chromosomes, not the plasmids, okay? So they do a genomic DNA. So then what they're gonna yield is you'll get this, you'll get a whole bunch of mixture of, let's say this is a, it'll connect it. This is a chromosome and somewhere probably on the chromosome, this transposon inserted somewhere. And you have a whole bunch of these times N, okay? Then what do they do? Kyle said it. So if you look at the actual, the actual thing, where are we here? It's at, here's where we're at. They prepped the genomic DNA, and then the DNA was digested with draw one. What do you think that is? If you know what it, well, don't don't answer. What do you think that is? If you just read DNA was digested with draw one. Yes. So if you see like a three letter code and then like a weird letter, that's typically a restriction enzyme. And then you know for sure it's a restriction enzyme if it says digested. So they digested it with this draw one. Um, I looked it up. Draw one is I think re is cutting at A, 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 T, T, T. So if you take genomic DNA and you treat it with a restriction enzyme, what do you think will happen? Lysis. No, Lysis no, is a no, very no, specific no, term. No, Wait, no. let me define this. Lysis <laughs> is a very specific term that means break open the cell. Yeah, a, so de a nuclease is not going to break open the cell. It would um, break the chromosome because, like, right now. You Where? Know, like, Where would it break the chromosome? Like, 
this, the sequ where we recognize the sequence. So wherever these sequences are, it's going to cut the chromosome. So what's going to be the result? This is going to turn into what? A lot of, a lot of pieces. Yes, it'll, yes, exactly. It'll turn into a lot of pieces. And how should I draw those little pieces? Big, small, one size, many sizes? Various sizes. Various sizes, yes, exactly. Like, it's going to cut that genome into chunks of various sizes based on wherever, like, wherever, like, let's, we can color code those sequence sites. Like, let's say, let's say this, you found one here, 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 here here, et cetera. Like you can get the idea of how it's gonna cut it at sort of random sites and you're gonna yield these products that are sort of of various sizes. And what's gonna be on the ends of these products? Five prime and three prime. Yes. What? Sticky ends. Yeah, it'll be sticky ends. So, and look, it's A-A-A-T-T-T. -T -T. So on one of these things, um, actually, I think it'd be T, T, T on the left, five prime, and I think it'd be A, A, A on the three prime. And this is gonna be the case for all these. So let's call this A and let's call this B. So all these molecules are gonna look like this. So then what's gonna happen? Don't say, Then what's going to happen? They're going to start like joining each other. What will join with what? Knowing that B is AAA and A is TTT. A with B. Yes. Okay. So now they're going to circularize just naturally. They're going to they're going to literally just form little circles. Is that considered recombination? No. This is not recombination. This is what would you call this? what's actually happening between A and B. You're hybridizing? Hybridizing or annealing. Yeah, it's not recombination. Recombination is when the DNA is not cut and it's like oh. intermingling. Okay, so they're all gonna circularize. So you're gonna get circles. You're gonna get circles of various sizes. Okay. Um, and some of these circles most of these circles will not have transposons in them because say like the genome looked like this, most of the circles won't have transposons in them. But some of these circles like this circle in this region would have a transposon in it. So you can understand the concept that one of these circles is probably gonna have the transposon. And so to find out where the transposon has inserted, you need to somehow now enrich for this one and get rid of all the others. So how would you enrich now at this point? What do you, what do you, how do you, how do you uh, get more of DNA that you want? Through a PCR. Through a PCR, yeah. So now is when they do the actual inverse PCR. So if you think PCR, I taught you PCR, if you have like gene X and a normal PCR is you're gonna wanna, if you wanna amplify gene X, let me get it like a fat. If you're gonna amplify gene X, you want like a forward primer and a reverse primer. And that's gonna amplify a sequence in gene X. This is standard PCR. What do you think inverse PCR is? They amplify They point outward. So they point out and they design their primers from inside of the transposon gene. So if here's your T gene, they design primers that go outside. And this is clever and it works because only because the DNA is circular. That's why this works. So the ones that, the ones that have transposon inserts can now be enriched through PCR because you have these primers that are going outside. And so it's gonna amplify all the way around essentially like the plasmid that has the transposon. And so you can go from a population of mostly sort of like genomic circularized extra stuff to a population enriched for your sequences where your transposon is into that plasma. Okay, and then what do they do? Then what, so, so now they've sort of like, they've got to the point where They've enriched, they have probably like a tube. They have a tube full of 
PCR amplified transposon inserts in chromosomes. Now what do they have to do? Well, if, let's think about that. Like, if they ran it on a gel, what's that going to tell them? It'll just tell them the size of those cuts. It'll just tell them the size. They don't really care about the size because the size would just be reflective of where the draw one cut. Like, they don't really care about that. What do they actually want to know? The sequence. They want to know the sequence. So what would be the better option? Sequencing. Some kind of sequencing. You could probably do Sanger. You could easily do Sanger here. Um, although the conundrum here is they probably they have mixtures. They have mixtures of um, a bunch of like fragments that are circularized where transposons have inserted in different sites. So if you did Sanger with that, you'd probably just get like a jumbled, you'd probably just get like a jumbled mess unless you isolated a pure plasmid first. So then there's a process after this where they now are isolating individual sequences. How do they do that? So if you look at if you look at nine, it says so. Here's where we're at. Reaction products. That's the inverse PCR products. Reaction products containing oligonucleotide encoded eco R1 and Hindi three sites were digested with these enzymes and cloned into PUC18. So now somebody on that side translate that for me. So they use those enzymes. Um to clone them into um, plasma. Yes. Okay, so now they take these mixtures and they add Hindi 3, which is another restriction enzyme, and I think the other one is Eco R1. And these cut at some site, let's say it's just here and here. So they cut these PCR amplified or enriched transposon insert mixtures with these two specific restriction enzymes and they ligate them into a plasma that they know, PUC18. Uh, so you have in this, you have some transposon and some random genomic DNA and that's now been cloned into PUC18 and now is when they isolate individual colonies. How many were there? It says right in the beginning of the paper, I think. Like 480? That's how many genes there were. How many? It's like 1,300. Is it? I thought it was like 2,000. That's how, oh yeah, that's how many genes in 1,300 to the individual uh, insertions. It's like 2,000. So something like 1,300 to 2,000. So they essentially isolated like 1,300 to 2,000 individual clones. And then from here, you can do Sanger sequencing on those individual clones. Or nowadays, you probably do like, you could probably just do like a next generation sequencing. You could probably even, you probably even wouldn't have to do this last step nowadays. You might, you might just be able to directly sequence from this. I don't know. But that's how they, okay, does anybody have any questions with like that workflow? Yeah. Why? Like, you said it was more time efficient for them to do, like, this digest process instead, but I don't Did understand I? why they... You said something along those lines. Like, it was so cool that they, after the electroporation, like, they put them into the little tubes instead. Why did they not just immediately plate the cells after electroporation? And how did they know that the cells that were in that, like... So, so when you say when you say plate, okay. So when you say plate, you mean plate them on antibiotics? Yeah. But they're growing them in antibiotics, so they're it's like they're they're doing the selection step. They're not skipping that. They're just right. growing. You're saying you'd rather have them plate on a plate, grow them individually as colonies, mm -hmm. and pick them like that. Because then you would get rid of the dead cells that are in there too. Because in the because I think here's I think here's why I think I think then then think about again think about the flow. So how are they how are they going to sequence these inserts? How would they, they do still it? Have to do it the same way that they did it. Right, and so now they have to colony. do it now they have to do it from individual colonies four thousand times, whereas here they just did it once on a mixture. It just increases the amount of times they have to do it. If they're doing that, they're doing a broad screen. They're not looking for an individual insertion region. They're looking for all of them. They do a broad spectrum screen of it, and that's why they just do this whole mixture. So this is actually like really worth like going slow and making sure 
you, you get the you get this point. Does, does that make sense or no? No. Okay. Okay. So so in these clones, if here's the chromosome, let's say let's say you pick one clone, one clone. There's the chromosome. Somewhere on that chromosome is a transposon. Okay, and you're growing a separate culture of let's call this clone let's call this clone A. So you grow a separate culture of clone A. Now to figure out what clone A has, you still have to do the inverse PCR, right? So you have to do inverse PCR on clone A. Okay, and then you see through inverse PCR, the inverse PCR, you would eventually get to the thing that you can say here, right? Okay. But now you've only done that for one clone. So now you have to now do it for clone B. But didn't they at the end have to screen 2,000 clones anyways? No, but, but they, yes, but they did have to screen 2,000 clones, but they did not have to do 2,000 inverse PCR reactions. Does that make sense? So the key thing here is that if you do it this way, you have to do 2,000 or infinite number of clones that many inverse PCR reactions. Whereas if you just grow these all together and you mix them together, you can do all the PCR in one reaction because your primers will all bind that transposon. So it'll work no matter where the insert is and you'll amplify a diverse mixture of these insert things. Um, so you only have to do that reaction once. Yeah. That's, I think it's as simple as that. Does that, question then, okay. In those original epigrams, like the one, two, three, when they split them up, how do they get rid of the dead cells? So if there was a transposon that jumped into an essential gene? Selection. So the, just the antibiotics? So, yes, yeah, so they'll add the antibiotics, the gentamicin. And the gentamicin is going to kill anything that didn't have an insert, in theory. Mm -hmm. So would they add the gentamicin to the tubes, or would it? Or would it just be when they pull it well, up? tubes are just like an abstract, like okay. like I I know I just want to say like I'm oh, not okay. I'm not I don't know if they grow them in tubes oh, or okay. test okay. tubes or Erlenmeyer flasks, yeah. but yeah, they add the gentamicin to the culture. Because I mean, whenever you grew them, they would have selected for it. Yeah. Okay. So so wait, is there more questions? Does that make sense? Okay. So I, we're on the same, I think we're all on the same page now where they get to the point and they get their sequences. They can sequence this now. And that's how they produce this figure. What's the debate? What's the debate? I was um, just wondering how the, because like even if the cell died, the genomic DNA would still be in there, but he said that they were waiting two to four weeks like yeah, they cultured it. They cultured it over a long period of time. Yeah, good question. Okay, so uh, now let's talk about the results. Um, this was interesting. So they found. Let's see if I can just type this. They found. Zoom in. They found species-specific genes were inserted in 5.5 times more than non-species specific. Why is that? Somebody explain that to me. So, um, I guess it, I guess they didn't know the genes that were essential. What? I guess um, the species specific genes, they inserted like five times greater than like the other ones. Yeah. Because they showed them that some genes, genes that were essential in certain species were kind of different. Well, I guess essential genes very special. Or is it? I think you're misinterpreting. Oh. So if a transposon inserts in a gene, is it essential? Oh, no, it's it's non-essential because it can survive when it's broken. So the question is, well, first of all, what's a species specific gene? That means they're looking at two. They're looking at the pneumonia, bleh, whatever. And they're looking at the genital, <laughs> the genitalium. They're comparing these, right? Oh. So what's a species specific gene? It means it's a gene that is either only in pneumonia or genitalium. And that's not essential to life because it's like making it specific. Yes, 
So, so that's what they discovered. That's exactly right. Is that things that make you species like things that make your species unique? Can't be essential. Well, like, like let's be careful. We don't want to say like can't be essential. Like biology is always kind of gray like that. But it's more likely that like that. Yeah, like that diversity is sort of just adding some versatility that allows them to colonize like a new niche that makes them a little bit different. But it's not necessarily essential to like the programming of the inherent organism. So that was really interesting. Um, so, so the idea is kind of like, um, it's, it, the, the bacterial idea is kind of like you have these, you have these bacteria and these bacteria have kind of like a minimal repertoire of like genes that are essential, almost like a chassis. Like if you have like a very basic sort of like frame for a car, and then on top of that, some species have like bells and whistles or like the CD player and the boom box, blah, 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 blah. And like other species don't have those things. So that's the idea uh, in an abstract sense. Oh, I have a question. Yeah. So while I was reading it, they did, I thought they had also said that they found some transposons in essential genes but it was able to fix it, so, in a way. They did find that, a couple, a couple, so I, I have that as a discussion point. Um, hang on, I'm trying to find, like, like, so there are, like, you bring up a point that. Like, I thought it was having to do with the promoter. There are some situations where an insert, um, I'm trying to think of how you say, say what you said again. Now or yeah, say what you said again. Like there was some situations where there was like there was transposons inside of an essential uh, gene or element. Yeah, I thought it was having to do with the promoter, like near the promoter, but I think I think they give I think you have to check the the writing, but I think there's some situations where don't they speculate that in those situations that gene might have duplicated? So there might have been like a paralog like in that particular strain. So, or, so what? Or that they weren't like necessary in certain environments. So yeah. they also talk about um, yes, fructose, fructose permease. Yes, I was actually going to bring that up. Uh, let me pull that out. So you, oh, hang on, let me pull that figure out because he kind of shows this like tiny figure. Uh, and if you didn't, if you didn't actually like read it closely, you kind of be like, well, like what is this? Um, so, so your point. Deborah, no, Lindsay. Okay, sorry. Your point, Lindsay, was that some genes are essential in certain environments. Okay, and here they give example of that. So, does anybody? Can anybody walk me through what how they read this figure? What what type of data is it? Well, they got the data from like a PCR. It is a PCR. So you're looking at an agarose gel. It's like the simplest thing. So it's a PCR. Uh, this one is a positive control. They're just showing you like in these two conditions, they can amplify some gene X. What's G and F? Glucose and fructose. Yeah, so one of these is glucose. The other is fructose. Okay, and then these are the two different species. I don't know which one is which, but the, the two different species. Species one, species two. First one is the gen, mm -hmm. second one is new, okay. And essentially what they're showing you is that when you grow in, let's see here, they're, what are they PCRing for? Fructose, Aren't they PCRing for the? Are they PCRing for the transposon insert in that gene? I think they. I think they're PCRing for like the transposon insertion into yeah, that gene. Know. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. specific. Yeah. So it's like you have a transposon primer, and then you have a primer in the other in the actual gene that it inserted into, and you're amplifying like this sequence in between, probably. And so when you're growing the cells in glucose, a transposon can insert into a fructose transporter.
because you don't need fructose when you're eating infinite glucose. But as soon as you switch and you take glucose away and you give them fructose, and the, a, a transposon cannot insert into that gene because then they have no way to permeabilize and bring in the fructose. Does that make sense? That's kind of, maybe that is kind of complicated. Yeah, say it. Say it again? Okay. Okay, so I'll try to, so, so the gene that they're interested in, this gene, it has some weird like number name, but it's a fructose transporter. So it goes into the membrane and it brings fructose into the cell. And the way that they're doing this PCR is if a transposon inserts, let's say a transposon inserts into the gene, like here, they can put one primer in the transposon and another primer in the actual fructose transporter. And so if you see an amplicon, so if you see a band, a band equals what? What does that mean if you see a band? Positive. Positive for what? That means that there was a reason that was amplified by the... Yeah, but, but it's a, a band equals what? The presence of the transposon. Yes, a band equals an insert equals a broken fructose transporter. Okay, so if you see a band, that is equivalent to a broken fructose transporter. And you only see a band for a broken fructose transporter in the presence of what media? Glucose, glucose media, because the gene can be broken when you're eating glucose. But if you're only eating fructose, you don't see the band. Why does that make sense? Because if you, if you break the fructose, the fructose transporter, you won't be able to eat the fructose. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Good. Um, good. This is a good, good discussion. Okay. So at the, at the very end, they say something like, um, we estimate 250 to like 350 genes are essential. They say something like that. My question is, why can't they get a, a, a solid number? Yeah, because yeah, that's a good answer. Because because biology, like biology is a little bit messy, is a little bit of gray things. We just pointed out the fructose situation where some genes are essential in certain contexts. Um, there's also situations where um, sometimes mutations can be codependent. So like you might have two genes that are mutated that where essentially like, what am I saying? It was saying that like some of them could be simultaneous while other ones couldn't. Simultaneous? Yeah, like, yeah, like you, you might not be able to get, like there might be codependencies where like if you get rid of one gene. One gene could be become essential if in the context of another gene being knocked out. That would be a codependency. In, um, you also need others, things like that. Like the orphan genes, like the ATP. Yeah. Something. Like you could have a few of those. You could them, but not all of them. Yes. So essentially like it's a little bit messy. So then the next question is, okay, well, at least we got like a real good list of 250 to 350 genes that are essentially essential. <laughs> uh, how would you prove then what the final subset is? What would you do? You would build what? You would build a chromosome with those particularly selected genes and see if it works. Yeah. So you could just, you, so you would build a chromosome and it's an interesting concept. So this is, keep in mind they had not done this yet before, but like that was their idea. It was okay, now let's, like first we wanna identify the essential genes. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take those genes, we're gonna build a chromosome and we're gonna take that chromosome and we're gonna essentially like do like a chromosome transplant into a living cell and stick this chromosome in there and see if it can survive. That's what they did next. And so that's how that they would prove like the minimal set um, required for life. Yeah, that, that was, I wrote that down. They said, uh, 
One way to identify a minimal gene set for a self-replicating life would be to create and test a cassette-based artificial chromosome in experiment pending ethical review. That means like, yeah, they're doing it. Um, yeah, I mean, that was basically it. So what I kind of want to do with the rest of the semester is like, this was in 1999, so this is almost 25 years ago now. Um, and they've had a lot of publications like since then. And I kind of want to follow this story through the publications as we go through the semester and we'll see kind of like how it developed. So this was the first paper. Any final questions? Yeah. Did they, this is probably gonna, or hopefully it would come up in like what you're about to talk about. Did they ever, like there are I think 111 genes that oh. they said were important, but they- just They didn't know what they did. Why. Yeah, what's the question with that? Did they ever identify what it Yeah. Happened? Yeah, so that was actually on my list of things to talk about. So that's awesome that you brought that up. So again, like it's an interesting thing that you do all this sequencing and sequencing was such a big deal, but a lot of the stuff that you sequence, you have no idea what it does. Somebody, like for each of these proteins, somebody literally probably has to do a PhD, like clone it out, try to figure out like what it does one at a time. And so when they did this, there's 111 genes with no known function. Um, and they actually made that as an important point, like how can we say that we understand life if there's literally in the simplest organism, there's still 111 things we don't even know what they do. So uh, they brought that up and then in the subsequent papers, I think they do figure out what most of these do. So, but that will leave that in mystery right now because I actually don't know what they do. Uh, but I think that they figured that out. Uh, any other questions? There was somebody else that had a hand raised, yeah. So when we talk about transposons, we said how they're random and they jump around randomly, right? Yes. But what, could you consider that the cell knows which funk, like what, what's essential and what's non-essential and determine where those transposons go? So it's still random. And the reason it's still random is because it's still inserting into essential genes. There's nothing inhibiting it. It's just that when that happens, that organism dies and then it doesn't survive. And you, so you don't see it in the data. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But it's still happening. Like it's still inserting and it's causing selection to bias the results. Yeah. This could be just like lack of knowledge about transposons, but how do they prevent the transposon from jumping multiple times in the same chromosome, in the same cell? I don't think they did. That's a good question. And that actually is an issue with transposons. Um, if you have hyperactive transposons, you might get an insert, but that insert can pop back out if, if there's an active transposon. Um, I think, I think like, that's a good question. I don't know how they like inhibited, but my, my belief is that the plasma that they're introducing the transpose on it probably has like hyperactive activity based off some promoters, I guess. Like maybe they have, a, like, like when we power transposons, we have an induction system. So maybe it's a situation where you induce it to jump and then it jumps in the chromosome and it doesn't have that regulation anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it's just kind of like now at basal activity. They have more materials and methods other than that. The they might. So I don't know if they did. Yeah. Sometimes the sometimes the science and nature papers have like supplemental methods. Um, yeah. This is an old, it's an older paper. Um, but also too, this is actually like a really simple paper. Like it's really simple what they did. And they cite they cite a paper where they pulled the plasmid from. So if you probably really wanted to know, you probably have to go back and look at that other paper. Yeah. Okay. We're over time. Good, uh, good, good participation. That was good. Hey, Campbell says that quiz four. Okay, that was not the my best, um, but hopefully this covers what we missed, and then we can continue on to the next papers. So, hope you enjoyed.